Okay, uh, so good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thank you for such an uh, invitation and some very interesting seminar. So in the next minutes, uh, well, 40 minutes, uh, it's a bit, bit more, I will talk about pictures. And uh, why picture? Well, as I mentioned in the abstract, pictures are actually the tangible trace of our visual world. Uh, they are materialization, they are classifiable, and that's important, they are a datable object. Uh, they reflect a vocabulary of expression uh, and uh, also bear witness of human production. They testify choice, quality, techniques, uh, as well as the, the, their, their cultural space where they are produced. And they consider them a tradition, trans meaning, uh, and through their iconographic and aesthetic choice. Uh, they reflect their contemporary knowledge dynamic, uh, they express the identity of a social landscape, and they indeed serve as a communication device. Um, nevertheless, uh, the study of image is mainly concerned, uh, specifically in the digital space, uh, with aesthetic qualities, uh, emphasizing, emphasizing primarily the figurative. But pictures, however, are more than that. Um, they, they are artifacts that exist in space and they exist in time, and the reach is a consequence of this physical circulation. And to investigate whether or how they are active or passive agent of change, uh, we need to examine the visual dimension from an historical perspective, like lighting connection and pattern. Um, now, the study of how we perceive a materialized visual content and uh, how and if such content affect our worldview are mainly developed following what two methods. Uh, that I call the singular type and the similar multiplicity. The singular type is the outcome of decades of art historical research and focus on the analysis of a single object in space and time. Uh, traditionally, such an investigation results in the study of circulation, exchange, influence, and adoption of a specific type, such as a technique, an iconographical variant, or a specific design. And this method relies very much on connoisseurship and examining individual or very small set of images as a vehicle to comprehend one or multiple dimension of the visual production of one artist. Uh, the similar multiplicity stem instead from the meeting of art historian and computer science, and this methodology used the power of computation to analyze large corpora of images, creating and proposing cluster of images considered similar in respect to a series of dimensions that are encoded in an algorithm. And as you see, this cluster present a, a reading based on visual affinity, and indeed they should make evident influence and exchange in between visual content. But the result of this process is generally, at the end of the day, a, a canvas where topological closeness imply visual similitude. Uh, such an analysis of the process uh, neglect the single image, switching the unity of analysis uh, with a multitude. Both methods do have their strength, uh, but indeed uh, most of the time they are not complementary. Uh, they are somehow parallel way of studying and understanding visuality, very often not in dialogue with each other. Uh, there is a third way, a middle ground and embed both uh, the method into a novel perspective, a multi-scalar analysis of how the visual content interact and circulate. And this new method, which we develop in the Visual Contagion project, starts from the computational analysis of similarity and uses results to examine image with respect to diverse description, such as the spatiotemporal attribute. And before diving in the method, let me start to give you maybe some context of what visual contagion really is. Uh, visual contagion is a, is a Swiss uh, National Science Foundation project, which was created by Beatrice Joye Pronel, which is the chair of digital humanity here at the University of Geneva, and indeed the PI of the project, and examined the global circulation of images in the print age of our century, uh, from 1890s to the advent of internet. And this timeline is not casual. Uh, is actually in the history of publishing, uh, it saw the emergence of somehow a visual economy because illustration became an integral part of the press in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, also illustrator magazine became widely available. The photographic printing technique became more sophisticated. And this innovation brought with them also new paradigm, new vision, new critique. And the project focused on describing and analyzing how certain images circulated more than other reproduction, copy, or imitation. And uh, he asked through which channel and according to which chronology they actually have spread. And the objective here is to understand what makes an image successful, but also to identify how the circulation of images contributed to the globalization of culture and whether or not it revealed the symbolic domination of certain country and culture over other at different times. 
uh, to attain this goal, we began the creation and development of a corpus of periodics, as well as in parallel, the development of a basic building block for computing the image present in such periodic. So on computer vision side, which I will not touch very much as I am not an expert in the area, uh, we deploy a platform uh, which is algorithm to detect an extract image from periodics, compare them together or suggest cluster of similarities. Um, how that work? Well, briefly, each image is decomposed and computed based on a set of dimension, which is called feature, and then compare across the data set. And the result is the one that you see here in the video on the slide. There's a series of clusters which contain images that are classified similar to each other. But indeed, this is one part. The corpus is somehow, I would say, the major one. Uh, and it was built using uh, already available resources uh, from GLAM institutions, so gallery, library, archive, and museum. And it's initially built, as many corpus do, as a list of periodics. Uh, we compile an initial list, and for each periodic, we document the two most important information we do have, the space and the time. Uh, so if we take uh, two periodics, as in the example, uh, we see that those already contain uh, important information for us. It's just, of course, the title, but also where it was published, by who, uh, sometimes publisher, sometimes present, sometimes not, and, but also specifically when it was published. Now, uh, why is that important? Where we can find, we need to look at this only manually. No, okay, as they come in from the GLAM sector, uh, those information are usually encoded in metadata. Um, they are encoded in JSON, in XML, many formats that somehow describe the object that a library archive or a memory institution hold in certain way that you can actually take them and start to use to describe the image that are in it. Because we know for each actually volume that has been published, if you know the, spa the spatial component and we know the time component, actually the image in it do have the same attributes. Of course, this is somehow the dreamy scenario. It's not always so well described. It's not always using metadata standards, such as in this case, which is mods. Uh, but there are some ways, some other uh, way that uh, um, these are proposed. Of course, we do have standardized methods. IIIF has helped us a lot, as we do actually work a lot with IIIF. Uh, but there is also SparkQL which is uh, mainly BNF. I have a lot of periodic in SparkQL and that helps us incredibly. Uh, but there are also tons of different API, uh, which do give you different results, but they need to be treated differently. And indeed, there are some manual work, sometimes in the form of web scraping. Uh, so some information are not available as metadata, then coded metadata, but they're just available in the HTML page. And therefore, that's where we need to take it. And of course, actually some manual labor, because we actually need to go uh, in certain case uh, and look at each periodic and try from each of that uh, to extract where it was printed and uh, when it was printed. Uh, this of course not for all, but some of them, yes. Now, uh, as you imagine, like having to deal with a global corpus as we do, so a large corpus of periodics uh, coming from so many different sources, we touch upon one of the major problems. Uh, which is the normalization of one. So we have places that of course written in so many ways uh, and uh, we have also so many dates, but that's somehow easier. Uh, but for places we do not need to normalize them. So that's exactly the next step once we have uh, this corpus is we link it uh, through Wikidata. Uh, for the one that you don't know, Wikidata uh, is a knowledge, uh, knowledge graph uh, from the Wikimedia uh, Foundation, uh, which is freely um, accessible, usable, but also more, important, more importantly, editable. And it do contain several inf geographical information about uh, each place. So all the city that we do have in our corpus, are, of course, normalized, harmonized, and somehow the term is reconciled against Wikidata. And out of that, we can take more information. Uh, such as the coordinate, for example, well, the English name versus the French name or many other, uh, but also the country where they belong to. Um, based on that, we can then actually start to create an understanding cartography of our corpus. And what you see actually here in the slide is, uh, uh, of, is actually the representation, graphical representation state by state of our corpus, of what we actually collected until now. Project start uh, in 2020, January 2020. So we are one year and a half. And uh, we have like a large 
global coverage. Of course, as you may see in the, in the cartography, some countries are more, are more represented than others, and there are indeed into that uh, some problem with the politics of digitization but, and also of access of them. But in general, we have around 600,000 records, counting more than 2,700 journals and more than 2,000 cities. And this is not the end. Actually, we are continuously working to increase the corpus. Uh, generally, uh, actually, in, the, in this today and in the next day, we are uh, ingesting and uh, uh, start to analyze a corpus that is Chronicle America, which has come from the Library of Congress and contain all the uh, newspaper digital uh, edition, a digital copy of the newspaper published in US until 1963, where of course, for copyright reasons, they are not available. As well as the Periodica, uh, which we are working on, uh, which is a Swiss instead, a repository of, uh, of journal published in Switzerland. And uh, it can actually, uh, with, actually until today, is freely accessible to everyone. Um, they, we cannot take all the data. In this case, if we take them, we are just using them for data mining. So we are not actually exposing them, uh, but uh, that's our next two step plus some other uh, that we actually found by the next two next big corpus, let's say. So uh, I show you as a, a state perspective of, of what we collected. This is somehow a, a different one. Uh, as the state somehow seems that we have stuff from all over the world, which is true, but we have indeed, uh, as you may see, a concentration, mm, a very Eurocentric uh, corpus, specifically France and German, um, having ingested practically all the periodic in the BNF, uh, has brought us to have so much thing from German, uh, from uh, France, pardon. But we do have uh, a lot from the East Coast, uh, but also from other places in US, as well as uh, if we see from Japan and uh, from South America. Uh, there are still a lot that miss, uh, but there is still a lot there is. Um, so this is to give you somehow a perspective of what uh, we are dealing on as a matter of global corpus. And I think another axe that we need to look at is how is this record uh, spread over time. Uh, so if we see a timeline of what we do have, we see that there is a concentration around uh, the 20s, uh, 20, 30 years, uh, first 20, 20, 30 years of the 20th century. And we can maybe uh, see it better if we look at it uh, in, in a map uh, where we actually can see how the, uh, the, the record are uh, distributed spatial temporarily uh, around. And uh, uh, as you may see, there are practically South America start to arrive later. And after the 60s, because of copyright reason, uh, we do not have very much. And that is a bit of a problem. Um, while we do have a lot more in the very first 50 years uh, of the century. Uh, now, um, this is somehow the, the overall architecture of the project. We start from these two parallel tasks, uh, which is, uh, actually have a list, a list of periodics uh, uh, and start to uh, analyzing them, but also collecting more and continues to improve these things uh, through no sources. And then after with on one side, start to process and extract the image and compare the image. And on the other side, use this data normalize them. Um, you may see that if you're familiar with OpenRefine, great tool for, for the job, uh, convert them in the RDF to, uh, we link them, we associate them together. We put actually the image with their metadata. And out of that, once they are, when they are together, we can make some further analysis. Um, the very first that uh, we do is somehow, uh, again, visual, even though, uh, as, you, as you may see, this is very different for actually what we uh, did present at the very beginning. At the very beginning, uh, uh, I present this pix plot, this uh, somehow topological closeness. In here, there is not only and purely about that. Each of the cluster that you see, they are also dated and spatially located. This allows us to see, for example, things that circulated the most across country as they are actually ordered that way. We can change, you see 33 images, 15 cities, seven countries. So it means that the, uh, the things that are considered similar in that cluster 
comes uh, or circulated across these countries, uh, this number of cities. Uh, we can, of course, change the criteria if we are more interested in intrastate circulation. Uh, in this case, we were very much interested in what cross borders. And uh, therefore, we can actually visualize and analyze uh, uh, the visual component based on those criteria and understanding what cross the border and what not. Um, now, this is a method, and this is somehow a, a novel way to do it. Uh, but uh, as I'm, I don't remember if I mentioned, but we do have 3 million images that we extract from our corpus, and 3 million images is a lot of images to actually analyze. Uh, we, here we can focus on certain things, but we also need to have an overlook and analysis and a global analysis of it. Uh, so, this interface, which is called Explore, developed by Robin Champenoise, uh, is an open interface. It uh, means that uh, we just, uh, uh, it's open to everyone. It's an explore.visualcontagion.com. Everyone can uh, put his own, his own image in AAA format and uh, get cluster uh, in, in return. Uh, and this is the first step of how to actually see the corpus. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, this is not enough. So the next step, uh, we decide to go towards a knowledge graph. As I mentioned before, we have metadata and we have image. So it's uh, very somehow easy uh, to constitute a visual knowledge graph out of that. If I'm talking about knowledge graph, uh, uh, many of you most probably are familiar with side of CRM and uh, do know RDF. Um, I will not start speaking about the RDF. It's my daily job. I love it, but it's going to take me 40 minutes out of that. But what is important to know uh, is that uh, this is not the only way to actually uh, put together our data. So on one side, we have a RDF-based graph, but on the other side, we have what is called property graph. Uh, most probably you're familiar with Neo4j. Uh, which is the most famous one, but somehow there is a whole universe of what is called gremlin-based uh, property graph, which they use uh, uh, gremlin as a query language, while Neo4j use Cypher and RDF, of course, use Sparkle. Um, why am I giving you this distinction? Because as I mentioned before, we create our data in RDF uh, in order to share them. But if you're thinking about an analytical perspective, RDF for us is not the right tool for the job. Um, it's not the right tool because mostly, uh, you have to admit, there are not that many interface or tools designed on RDF. Neo4j is a private company. That is why somehow, or it's also easy as a data model for a developer to understand that, that is why maybe there are uh, many resources uh, together. So, we do have these two parallel uh, perspective on one side, we share the data in RDF, on the other, we load them on a graph database, which is Neo4j. Um, why Neo4j? Uh, because it gives us uh, uh, already a, um, the possibility to use some certain graph algorithm, and uh, there is a lot of visualization possibilities. Uh, for graph uh, algorithm, uh, I mean algorithm that we can run on actually what we store in the graph. And there is a huge library of graph data science already integrated in Neo4j. Uh, so for example, what you see in the background of this slide are, are a result out of uh, Neo4j uh, that puts certain node uh, bigger than others. Uh, this is called a page rank algorithm. And the page rank algorithm uh, do simply compute as it was doing page rank because it was developed by Google at the very beginning to actually order the result, the page rank. Um, and in this case, apply to graph to understand which nodes are somehow more important or bigger because they receive more incoming links. Uh, and as you see, Paris received a lot of them in respect to uh, many other, yeah. And uh, so this is just a basic graph algorithm that we can run uh, on Neo4j in a very easy way. There are many other, Louvain for community detection, for example, uh, but there is a large library with proper explanation uh, to actually how to do it. So we decide to analyze this large corpus uh, also with a graph. And uh, we load them in a, in a new 4J graph with um, a basic model that I'm not even discussing. I mean, this is just made for internal purpose in order to connect uh, somehow what are the entity we speak about. And thanks to that, we can actually start to explore the graph. 
Um, there is a basic tool that comes with Neo4j um, that is Bloom. Uh, it's a, a very data scientist oriented tool, which allow you to search. In this case, we are searching for Marseille within the graph. So a free text search is gonna retrieve the node. And out of that, we can start our own exploration. And um, this is in a very, very easy manner. So understanding which things are related to, for example, Marseille. And uh, how that somehow is related to other nodes is another question. Another important one, if we think about uh, the general querel that exists uh, in, between, uh, in between art historian about the importance of the city versus the periphery. So Paris and New York City are somehow considered the center of visual. Of visual. And uh, uh, some other researcher uh, debated this because this is mostly about, they talk about Paris and, and New York and they don't talk about everything else. In this case, we can easily see that we select a node on New York and we computed the shorter path within the node, saying that uh, somehow there is a cluster that contains visual, uh, visuality that is published in Marseille, but also saying that is published in New York. Um, in this case, and using this method, we can easily compute more uh, interconnection between, for example, Pittsburgh and Marseille instead of Marseille, New York, and trying to understand that in order to uh, the visual do spread only through Paris or only through New York, or actually can spread in between the what they are called periphery. Uh, and this is done, as you have saw here, in a, in a very easy manner. Uh, just a couple of clicks and a couple of research, uh, not a problem. Uh, for example, trying with two um, French uh, cities, which is uh, Toulouse and, and Marseille, uh, we can see how they are interconnected, um, how they are interconnected, for example, New York through London. Uh, but this is somehow you know, a very basic, uh, basic query. Uh, if we want to analyze a bit more, uh, it's important to use the other tool that Neo4j give you, which is uh, the browser. And in this case, we made a query that asks for the cluster that circulate the most. So the one that encompass more countries or more cities. And already this uh, gives us um, another perspective of the area. If we see that Marseille is connected to New York, and if we take a look somehow at this graph, uh, at a larger picture, uh, we can recognize two patterns. Uh, first of all, that France uh, talks a lot by itself. Uh, France is very auto-referential. Uh, here we have Paris, uh, which and all the cluster point to Paris, uh, and all the city, other city around France somehow talk to Paris primarily. Uh, while Paris is in charge of talking with the rest of the world. That's not the case, for example, for Germany. Uh, and Germany is way more spread, so I'm sorry, yeah, we have some zoom of, of Paris and all the other city, but more interesting in here, uh, we have actually an understanding of all the different cities in Germany, how they are more interconnected with the United States in terms of visuality uh, as, as France is. Uh, there is some place in France we can see uh, Besançon, for example, uh, but generally all uh, French and French colonies, or ex-French colonies, sorry, um, and in here I'm talking about Algeria or Vietnam, they are connected to Paris. But uh, if we see this, uh, we see a very small uh, graph, it's 300 elements, so we have our own limitation. Uh, in order, we try to make a query a bit uh, uh, bigger, uh, including more nodes, and in the case, in actual Bloom, we get this, uh, which is a bit uh, uh, incomprehensible. Uh, so it's very difficult, it's easy to use this tool, but at a certain point, we find ourselves that we have a problem reading it. So in this case, we added a, novel, a new dimension. Uh, and uh, instead of 2D, we passed to 3D uh, in order to try to understand if with 3D, we can actually uh, see more. So, and as you see, adding another dimension allow us to somehow have a better understanding of uh, such a complex graph. And also in this case, this is a 3D graph loading around 100,000 nodes. Uh, and uh, so it's a bit slow. Uh, but it's still usable and uh, you can actually dive in and analyze each of them. Uh, as you may notice, uh, these are all color code based on property in the graph, such as, for example, everything that is uh, from Germany as the color red, if I remember correctly, and everything from US is as a color uh, green, while everything from France is light blue. And those little things that you see in between, those are cluster of images that are interconnected. Um, so, uh, and the biggest 
thinks of all is Paris, uh, of course, because we have a lot of records about it. Uh, but here we can see again the pattern uh, that we saw before, but it's a larger scale. Uh, we saw, for example, we see, for example, how Germany is more interconnected and how France is very out of reference. Yeah? But we also see, for example, that Poland uh, is more interconnected with Germany and with the US uh, as much as practically everyone else. So everyone else who respect more the German model of visual communication in respect of the French. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, this is just, we can actually clearly see and explore. Uh, of course, we now using simply uh, city and cluster, we, we did the same for journal and other, but it is a, a nice way to have a larger vision of what is inside. Um, and what is inside actually? Uh, we see the distribution, but uh, it is actually important uh, to actually the visual content in it. And uh, the visual content is that uh, we do have uh, four major uh, type of picture that we can uh, look at our, our uh, um, corpus. Um, so, of course, we have all different kinds, um, but quantitatively, we have a large amount of picture of sacred objects that uh, do circulate a lot. And, um, well, not surprisingly, they are mostly Christian and um, practically almost entirely. Uh, there is art, art is the thing that circulates the most uh, in between countries. Um, specifically in between France and Germany, which was a kind of a revelation because during the period there were several papers that were saying that there was no visual communication between France, uh, France and, and Germany. Uh, there is also boost, uh, don't, so the human figure, um, not notably only men, but actually pretty, pretty much 50-50 men and women and also a lot of children. Uh, however, this after the 1940s is absolutely disappeared. And there is uh, also cars, uh, and that's uh, uh, an important uh, part of it, is also dedicated to car. But, okay, we saw this, so what? Uh, well, we, of course, uh, saw how the distribution, the circulation of the visual do appear to have taken place. Uh, we, of course, need to enlarge the corpus, but some patterns already are visible. Uh, we saw that certain things uh, uh, get uh, circulate more than others, notably art. And uh, we also saw that some objects uh, are start to make an appearance and at a certain point, they boom. And this is the case of cars. Um, cars, uh, and that uh, is why we try to, for each of those four, four topics, uh, to somehow dive in and try not to just focus on this large visuality, but try to understand why uh, they, they circulate the most and why they are there and what that can tell us. And uh, I decided to actually bring the other example of cars uh, because cars are uh, a very peculiar object. Uh, in the sense that there, there is this innovation in the 80s, but there's not very much welcome initially. Um, as many other technical innovation, car has been regarded with both a critical as well as a loving eye. And they are one probably a perfect example of this multiplicity of perspective, what they still are today. Um, but uh, the history of car, because of this multiplicity of perspective, is very rich in conflict and critique, uh, specifically in the North Atlantic, uh, originating mostly in the US and then in Europe. Um, and uh, it's important to understand that bicycle had a similar fate a few years back, but uh, cars had something more. Uh, they were the subject of many letters, of articles, of images, expressing phobia or desire for such object. Uh, very, it was considered very controversial. And uh, this multiplicity of, uh, of opinion has lasted practically until the 50s, uh, when they become way more standardized, uh, at least symbolically speaking. And then quoting what is that was uh, uh, the, the mayor of Munich uh, uh, at the time, uh, it was nearly suicidal for a politician in the 50s to take a position against Carr. Um, now a bit are changing. I don't know if the mayor of Munich right now will take a position against the autobahn, if it will, it will be suicidal or not. But uh, at the time, uh, it was right now, and the 50 was considered right now something so standardized that somehow uh, that uh, they would not, uh, uh, it was not controversial anymore. Uh, but then the question why uh, the car were so controversial, why they stopped being so? And the answer to this question can be seen here on, on the slide, actually, and is the street. 
Uh, today we look at the street as the place for cars, uh, while the pedestrians really are confined to the sidewalk. And the use of, if we think about the use of street for children playing, you can see obviously wrong. However, this idea is born and bred in the, in the first year of the diffusion of car. And from the perspective of zone time, car was the intruder. So um, this introduction, introduction of car and became this novel disruptive element uh, uh, because at the time street was a mixed environment. Uh, there were street car, pedestrian or carriage and the latest invention of the bike, but no specific rule were present for crossing the street. They will be later introduced due to car. And there was not so much distinction between sidewalk and actual street. So it was a very uh, pedestrian free environment where they could roam freely uh, because somehow they were not something so fast uh, as cars around. So um, it's easy to understand uh, the introduction of the car was my very disruptive to this kind of environment. And uh, was very disruptive, not simply uh, because uh, it was somehow something else that was present as the bike was, uh, but because there was uh, the car was coming with some thrills, some promise of a thrills, uh, which was the thrill for speed. Uh, seller of automobile um, long recognized this this thrill for speed, this need for speed, and uh, they by sponsoring auto racing, of course, but also the promoting aggressive driving. And many motorists initially were actually very much um, driven by that. And there were quotes uh, such as of Cav Mirabeau, and uh, in 1908, when I'm in the car possessed by speed, the humanitarian feelings drain away. Uh, or many other that somehow describe this uh, out of body sensation of being in the car. So um, speed was of course uh, very important because it is one of the disruptive elements, uh, but it was not the only reason for buying a car. Of course, it's important to also notice the cars were also taken to for mobility purpose. And so also for going on the countryside where they create more problem. If the first problem is connected to the city very much, uh, going to take some fresh air in the countryside also create enormous problem for the countryside itself. As uh, it saw this new noise and new, uh, new um, somehow vehicle around uh, creating a bit of a mess and also killing animals, specifically dogs. Uh, now, they were not uh, uh, the only victim. Uh, the problem is the, the city road were full of children, full of people. And therefore, this, uh, the car and uh, uh, were seen as some form of killer uh, because the incidents start to become a commonality. So they start to be called motorists, start to be called rider, road dogs, speed demon, uh, juggernaut, that car, the mother Moloch. And uh, there's going to be a few years uh, uh, before the, the safety movement took place and somehow they introduced uh, rules for, uh, um, and a sense that the street belonged to car. Uh, but this started to happen only in the 20s in the US and uh, movement in Europe start, uh, start a bit of a decade later. And in the end of somehow the motor clubs and the auto industry, uh, which initially would blame pedestrian and cyclist. And this, this blaming, uh, was actually extremely important in the sense that uh, one blamed the other. Uh, on uh, one side, we saw that uh, the, the motorists were accused of being murderer, and on the other side, the motorists were accusing the pedestrian of being the old, of being uh, somehow very much uh, connected with the past. They don't want the novelty, they don't want the speed, they don't want to be modern. And uh, this was uh, a problem because uh, it start to, they start to raise some tension in between this group of people. Uh, because uh, as, the, as they were mentioning that uh, the incident is becoming uh, um, a regular column in the daily press. Um, so uh, this, uh, um, this struggle in between, uh, we see that the motorists uh, were somehow uh, stopped uh, or uh, um, stoned, <laughs> was actually throw stone at. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, just to mention another quote by a German motorist uh, that uh, was mentioned in the, in the diary in 1905, that the journey uh, by automobile through Holland is dangerous since most of the rural population hate motorists uh, fanatically. Um, we even encounter older men, their face contorted with anger or without any provocation through fist-sized stone at us. And this was not a common, and there was a, also 
uh, we can report for an American millionaire, uh, uh, Vanderbilt II, that in an European tour, was attacked by mob and threw stone at after killing uh, some dogs in the French countryside. And this most mob's attack were so common that there was a law in Germany in 1909 that allowed for fleeing the scene in case of an accident, as long that you would report the next day uh, to the police. So it was a very, very common uh, phenomenon. Um, it was so common uh, that uh, it seems quite interesting to understand and try to see uh, what is the role of the picture in it. Uh, in, this, in this slide, you saw uh, many pictures depicting somehow uh, the, uh, the phenomenon. The phenomenon, uh, but uh, uh, we wanted to understand a bit more about it. Uh, we saw there were protests, uh, there is lots of documentation about, uh, lots of books written about, about protests, about letters in the newspaper, about even images. So what we did to understand how the phenomenon originate and uh, what can we say about and what's the role of the picture uh, specifically they were vehicle to the propaganda of car, of advertisement. They were instead used in numeristic journal to actually make, uh, underline uh, the, the problem. Uh, what is, uh, what kind of journal were doing what? Uh, so for doing that, we collected uh, a corpus of um, 5,000 images that depict car and we start to classify them. Um, mostly coming from Europe, but also US and one instant China, okay. Uh, but um, well, we see from the cartography mostly French and German. So, and um, if we again project them in, in time and, and space, uh, and as you see here, we can see already a, a heat map of the concentration of, of this 5,000 image, which mostly represent Europe and the east coast of the US, uh, notably places such as Pittsburgh, Chicago, and New York. And uh, out of those 5,000, we look at that, uh, uh, not a purely single picture uh, that exists in just one place. We see that there is also uh, some uh, exchanges, so some of them specifically in Munich, Berlin, and New York, Chicago. Uh, but those pictures that are present, those pictures of car, uh, they do circulate across countries and across the Atlantic. And uh, we were very hopeful to, to, to see out of that what would uh, come out. And uh, we also classify them uh, based on category of journal. Uh, so that we have pictures that are coming from, of course, automobile journal, but we wanted to be sure there are a lot more that are coming from other journal. So uh, we decided to take this picture and to actually um, project them uh, in time uh, using some keywords, using this tool, which is called Vicus Viewer. And in order to understand what kind of our picture were coming from where, uh, was the team they were more connected with, and uh, they represented us within the whole corpus. Uh, so in this case, we can, uh, we can just check uh, maybe um, some simple team, but uh, more important for us, uh, and of course, each single picture in order to understand the iconography. Uh, but uh, uh, more important would be like actually to check what is uh, the um, what are the picture with incident in it? Um, so we took a look at this. You see already there are not many match. Uh, there are some keywords that are attached to it, and we can check uh, that was actually the representative of keyword in respect to the incident was actually very important. But we also got a bit lost because we see that there are not that many picture about it. Uh, and actually, out of a corpus of five thousand images, we see that there are this amount of picture. This two slide. This is all the picture that we do have in 5,000. A lot of humoristic, of course, you can see that, but it's around 20, 25 picture out of a corpus of, of 5,000 image of cars. Um, so we took a look at the, actually the, the distribution in time and uh, looking at the year publication, you can see they've been published in between 900 and 922. So timeline fits somehow perfectly with the source. And there is a spike in 05, 06, 07. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, they are somehow uh, distributed, um, but uh, that uh, mostly in those who concerning us and mostly humoristic journal, which also fit with the model that we see in the literature. Um, but then something, of course, were wrong because in here we do not have many pictures. So um, out of that, I decided to look at another source, which is Library of Congress, and uh, that I mentioned before, the Chronicle American Project. 
which uh, which this tie is historical issue of a large part of the US newspaper from uh, until 63. And uh, this corpus, um, we, it can be searched both textually as well as visually. Um, they have an interface for visual search based on similarity and they, uh, an interface for textual search where we can have some uh, word and we can uh, search across uh, word pair, uh, which do not have to be connected, but can be closed. Um, so I, I try with, um, with some example of car crashing, killing, collision, incident, etc. But I could not find there very much either. Uh, now, this corpus is not in visual contagion yet. Uh, it's going to be put like very soon. Uh, but uh, uh, as we, we see that there are somehow very little picture about it. Although in the literature, uh, we do uh, present themselves that this is a visual phenomenon, a phenomenon that is explained visually, somehow being recognized visually, and yet there are no pictures. Um, so I try to see if maybe was something wrong again with the corpus by looking at journal type in this case. Uh, so we see the tumor at the beginning, then uh, um, it became very popular topic across a series of journal. Uh, we can see uh, for each year the category of uh, category journal type where these image are present. And we can see it become pretty widespread, this present sport, children, fashion, but those culture and news type of, uh, type of uh, um, in periodic. And a um, little before 1920, different type of art and cultural journal, everything that's in, in green in this line somehow, um, became prominent place for showing cars and finding new customers. This is all coming from the visual contagion corpus. And uh, this lasts uh, until the 30s, and uh, the 30s until it became mostly regional news. So already integrated in the social habit of Europe as well in the US. Um, but so um, somehow this left, left us puzzle and uh, I oh, I wanted to arrive here and give you a solution but uh, there is not we do not have uh, this picture uh, we have a lot of advertisement of car and maybe maybe that is why uh, there is uh, no picture but maybe I'm just looking at this as a person who very no, known very well out of advertisement in newspaper at the moment work um, but uh, one thing we do know is that the answer is not there yet and uh, the image are not there yet either. So we don't know what's happening. Are we actually over, um, overlooking the phenomenon? We're giving too much, uh, too much uh, prominence, uh, but or maybe mm, is the corpus the problem? Um, so I, we don't know really where to, to look at. And I think that this is uh, somehow uh, a great conclusion uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the discipline itself shows that digital methods are extremely important for the analysis. We saw certain things are being somehow verified. Uh, certain things have been uh, a, a given a more element to consider. Uh, certain other it does instead uh, uh, ask us to pose more questions. Um, as a as a problem of the of the corpus, are we looking at the phenomenon of car? in a different way. Maybe the literature about was not considering so much globally the picture, but they were considering case studies. And therefore it seems that there were a lot in maybe one city. Uh, are we maybe not using the visual, maybe they were not using the visual in the, in the periodic uh, in the same way they were using for poster. Maybe they were using only poster too. Uh, to actually uh, advertise uh, such an event, but because we know out of literature, the event were there, there were protests, there were committee, uh, there were people going around in the street, there are laws out of this. So it seemed that the civic arrest was there, but we don't have any visual, uh, any visual uh, information about it. So um, that's, I believe it's, it's a great conclusion because it actually forces us to, to try to understand what data science gave us, what all this digital method give us. Uh, are we looking at it as an auxiliary discipline or are we looking at it as a method itself for studying something and in case uh, it is, because in here it is, it become part of it and become part of it because it completely overtook what the literature was saying and it poses something, some new question about what happened here. And this would not be doable without a large data set of images and would not be possible without an instrument to analyze such a big amount of data. Uh, the question remains unanswered. 
and um, it's a very uh, peculiar tone to conclude a uh, conclude a, a presentation but i like the question remain an answer somehow uh, because this can actually open new hypotheses and open up a new possibility to actually explore it further. And uh, that uh, I think I reached my 45 minutes. So that is it from my side. Thank you very much.